I would like to welcome you all to the Midwest Action Against Drones Conference. We have many wonderful speakers here today, and we're very happy that we we'll, could all come out. Um, so our first speaker is an active member of the Anti-War Committee Chicago. He is retired and lives in Evanston. Uh, this is Newland Smith. Welcome, Newland Smith. I do want to, on behalf of the Anti-War Committee Chicago, add my welcome to this Midwest Action Against Drones Conference. Thanks to all of you who came out yesterday afternoon for the rally in the market to Boeing headquarters. And a special thanks to for a good, probably almost uh, half people here who came from some distance from the upper Midwest. In late July, 15 people gathered for three hours at the 8th Day Center for Justice, uh, just a couple blocks away from here, to make decisions on the timing of the action and this conference. Also, at that meeting, it was decided to focus on reports on the movement against drones from the ground. You know, in short, what strategies, what tactics work best in specific campaigns? So this is a, a, uh, a conference where we'll all be rolling up our sleeves and really listening from each other and, and coming together at the end to say what are the next steps. To begin this opening session, Kate McIntyre will speak briefly about the Boeing campaign here in Chicago. Kate will be followed by Joe Usbaker, who will describe what this movement against drones is up against. And then Medea Benjamin will give a keynote inform us what the movement against drones must do to succeed. The session will conclude by recognizing the organizations involved in the movement against drones who are at this conference. We will then have the opportunity to share learnings, best practices from the field during two rounds of workshops led by activists from protesting drone bases, command centers, and drone manufacturers, contractors, to activists in the work of the regulation of drones, successful movement building, and a workshop on the economics what drones are costing our communities. The closing plenary will then provide time to ponder what this learnings will mean for the next steps in the movement against drones. I would like to end this welcome call to order by sharing a brief reflection about surveillance from the Judeo-Christian tradition. I have to admit I was a theological librarian for 43 years in the Christmas seminary, so it's sort of in my bones. <laughs> Well, Lord, you have searched me out and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Psalm 139. These verses bear witness to the Israelites' conviction that Yahweh, their creator and protector, knew their innermost thoughts and even traced their journeys. God's intimate presence is also captured in the following opening words of the Collect for the Holy Eucharist. Almighty God, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Open common prayer. God's creatures, even though they are tempted to be like God, are reminded of the limits God has placed on them. Humankind has no business in letting their governments act like God as it begins to employ drones to track the journeys of its citizens. Nor does our government have the right to use drones for targeted assassinations. I believe we must call our government, the national security agents, drone command centers and manufacturers to accountability to summon, if you will, these powers and principalities to their proper location that is the enhancement of human life and society.
<laughs> this is so, this doesn't even represent a tenth of what Kate does. However, I will say, um, Kate McIntyre helped organize the student contingent at NATO and is a member of the National Working Committee for Students for Democratic Society. She is a proud member of the Anti-War Committee Chicago. She is tireless. She has an amazing sense of humor. She's a wonderful speaker. So please welcome Kate McIntyre. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, it is an honor to be among so many who are not only fighting against this new wave of military technology, but who also understand the concept of victory to one is a victory to all. We in the Anti-War Committee Chicago know that Boeing is only one piece of the expansive military-industrial complex that threatens to engulf not only this country, but the entire world. Yet, we see stopping Boeing from obtaining its killer drone contract as a very important victory for the anti-war movement in the U.S., as well as a way to show solidarity and support to those countries that are living in fear under their shadows. Before beginning the story of our campaign surrounding Boeing, it is important to understand how the Anti-War Committee Chicago came about. After the 15,000-person protests against NATO in May of 2012, anti-war sentiment in Chicago was rejuvenated and on the rise. The lesson many of us had learned at the RNC protests of 2008, linking demands to end war to economic demands and tying several struggles together to increase our numbers, had once again worked. We formed the Anti-War Committee Chicago with the goal to continue this kind of organizing. Organizing that would illustrate how the 1% is causing the economic crisis and attacking working people across the U.S. while, at the same time, going to war with countries across the world for their own gain. Boeing is the second largest weapons manufacturer in the United States. 46% of its profits in 2011 came from arms sales, bringing the total to $31.8 billion. When Boeing moved its headquarters to Chicago in 2001, it received $64 million in tax breaks, 20 million of which came from the city of Chicago itself. Yet, the past few years in Chicago have seen tremendous attacks on the public sector. Half the city's mental health clinics have been shut down, 49 public schools have been closed, and public transportation fares have increased substantially, while lower income areas face diminishing bus and train lines. The University of Illinois Chicago, one of the only public universities in Chicago, had a 9.5% tuition hike in 2010. Yet, Boeing CEO James McNerney received a 20% raise in 2012, bringing his total salary to $27.5 million. His pay is more than Boeing paid in taxes that year. While this was said at the rally yesterday, I want to again emphasize these are not isolated incidents. This is a direct correlation of a system where the rich few exploit the masses. Additionally, of the 500 headquarters jobs Chicago gained, over 80% were filled by transfers from Seattle. Clearly, Boeing is not creating jobs or aiding the working class citizens of Chicago. It only serves the bloodthirsty interests of the 1%. And when I use the word bloodthirsty, it is not exaggeration or hyperbole. While I feel that all that are here in this room understand this, part of the work that the Anti-War Committee Chicago does in its Boeing campaign is make it clear that we want no part of money that is generated by creating weapons used to terrorize and kill those overseas. I do not want Chicago to be known as the birthplace of the next killer drone and I am deeply saddened to know that Chicago-based Boeing provided GBU-39 bombs, which are made with depleted uranium, to Israel in the 2008 and 2012 sieges on Gaza. When these bombs are dropped, the depleted uranium stays in the soil for billions of years. The Palestinians who were not killed in these attacks have seen sharp increases in cancer rates and birth defects due to the effects of the uranium. In short, Boeing has contributed to the suffering of the Palestinian people and has aided Israel's brutal occupation. 
We should also be clear that while the, while the Phantom Ray is Boeing's first killer drone prototype, they have been and continue to make drones that assist in threatening and carrying out assassinations in countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. The child-sized coffins we placed at Boeing's doorstep yesterday represent 100, over 178 children that have already been killed in Pakistan and Yemen, and the countless more whose blood will be on Boeing's hands if it wins this military contract. Willa Watson, an activist with both the women's movement and the indigenous Australia movement, once said, if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. When we demand money for people's needs, not for drones and drone warfare, we are not diminishing the devastation and death countries like Pakistan, Yemen, Afghanistan, and many more have suffered under the hands of US imperialism. On the contrary, we are recognizing that we have much more in common with the people of those countries than we do with our quote unquote leaders here and that the first step in ending the suffering abroad is challenging those leaders here to value human needs over greed. We are recognizing that while the drone strikes are designed to diminish our numbers here by putting US troops out of physical danger and to separate and disconnect us from the suffering of our brothers and sisters in those countries, we know that, as Martin Luther King once said, the security we profess to seek in foreign adventures we will lose in our decaying cities. The bombs in Vietnam explode at home. This is especially true for drone pilots who have higher incident rates for anxiety disorder, depressive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, and suicidal ideation. We know that while it is important to continue protesting against drones and drone warfare, we also know that technology is not going to stop if we stop the policy of using drones. The Pentagon right now is working on weapon systems that include microtechnology, biotechnology, and artificial intelligence. By 2025, according to the Army, half of the armed forces will be robotic. That is what the future looks like if we do not work to stop it in its tracks before it starts. We have seen from the recent slowdown on the US's threats against Syria that when we work together, we are a powerful force. The Anti-War Committee Chicago feels that if we are able to stop Boeing from winning this killer drone contract, we have a blueprint to shut down the new forms of technology that the military will ultimately come up with in its place. This is not to say that we are fighting a losing battle, but rather for us to be realistic and understand that the fight does not end here. I have been involved in the anti-war movement since 2007. There is a picture of me at my first protest holding a sign that says, Troops Out Now. I want to remind us that the drones are not an answer to that demand, and we must continue our work and stress this point to others. Many folks here have been involved for much longer than I have, but there are also people who are newer to the anti-war movement. I find it inspiring to be among each and every one of you. Like Ella Baker said, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I believe that everyone in this room today is a fighter and will continue fighting until freedom and justice for all is not just an empty phrase in a Pledge of Allegiance, but a reality for those in the US and across the globe. Because the people united shall never be defeated. Thank you. Uh, from Fox News to Press TV. 
Um, anyone who has organized with Joe can attest not only to his friendly and affable nature, but also his dedication and determination to build anti-war movement. So, welcome Joe Ospay. <laughs> out that um, uh, of the three people that coordinated the local um, mobilization, um, Pat Hunt is the second of the triumvirate, so sitting here to my left. So um, uh, I'm going to talk about, um, well I don't know how to, how to entitle this, um, uh, 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 Somebody once wrote a book called Imperialism and War, so I'll, I'll just use that title, just borrow that one. <laughs> so uh, at the start of this month, beginning of September, um, the whole world was tense, on edge, um, as the U.S. proclaimed that it was going to start missile strikes against Syria. It seemed likely to most observers that the, the war wouldn't be two or three days but like the war in Kosovo or like the 98 bombing against uh, Iraq, that it would go on for several months. Um, and <clears throat> the generals were promised that it would cause more deaths and destruction than two and a half years of uh, the uh, efforts of the uh, Free Syrian Army. Um, and, and then Russia proposed a diplomatic solution to take serious chemical weapons and I, I don't know if I, I can't speak for everyone, but to my great surprise, um, the U.S. government accepted it. But then John Kerry said that the U.S. would go along with putting serious weapons under international control only if there was the threat of force in a U.N. resolution. But then this last Friday, the U.S. had to back down on getting the U.N. Security Council uh, resolution on eliminating uh, Syrian chemical weapons. Um, they had to drop the threat of force if Syria doesn't comply. So, um, stepping back, we can see that for two and a half years, the U.S. has funded and directed uh, the, the forces uh, to intervene with the Gulf uh, uh, Coordination Council, with Israel, Israel and NATO, you know, uh, Turkey is part of NATO, playing roles. On the other hand, the U.S. has refused direct military intervention, you know, bombing or invasion. So, what explains these contradictions, and why the back and forth, why the sudden reversals? Why couldn't the U.S., the most powerful military might ever on the planet, carry out this war on this small nation? Um, you know, it's a contradiction. There are some other things going on in Syria that, that also seem contradictory. So, as I said, the U.S. has spent two and a half years funding uh, this armed attack on the Syrian government and the people of Syria. The largest number of deaths, by the way, contrary to most... Uh, of the Western media, the largest number of deaths have been caused not by the forces of the um, Syrian government, its army and militia. The largest number of deaths have been caused by uh, the combatants armed by um, uh, 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 the, um, the Gulf Coordinating Council and backed by the U.S. Um, the U.S. has been doing this ever since the Arab Spring in 2011. The moment there was a mass protest movement in Syria um, against you know, I mean, you have to recognize it. That, that mass movement was protesting unpopular policies of neoliberalism, opening the Syrian economy to world finance, and the resulting austerity measures. Um, they, you know, there were some legitimate grievances in that. But the moment that that happened, the U.S. began to make its move. They armed the only forces that they could find inside of Syria um, and sent in, at this point, according to the Russians, 40,000. Uh, foreign fighters, many of whom are aligned with the Salafist movement, um, such as the Al-Nusra Front and, um, and other Al-Qaeda-linked groups. By the way, uh, this week we also learned that the moderates that John McCain met with when he was over there, uh, they had a press conference in which they, they said that they're going to quit the puppet um, Free Syrian Army um, uh, because it's what it is, and they called it that. And instead, they're going to um, form a, uh, they're going to join forces with al-Nusra and, and form an Islamic front um, instead. <clears throat> but, uh, but then, in the, uh, this week's uh, issue of Foreign Policy Magazine, the most influential uh, uh, you know, publication on that topic in Washington, uh, the, the editors put out that 
they think Assad will go and be replaced by the former defense minister, a guy by the name of Ali Habib. Um, this article reflects thinking in the White House about how to resolve the Syrian conflict, um, as well as the worries in Washington and Israel that the sectarian, foreign-led, and dominated armies aligned with al-Qaeda would, would come to power if the U.S. and Israel succeeded in forcing out Assad. So how come the U.S. says that its main mission on Earth is to fight al-Qaeda, but then they arm al-Qaeda against countries that have never attacked the U.S.? You know, isn't this a contradiction too? So let's answer these, these two questions by looking at some, some general uh, questions. You know, what's the status of U.S. power in the world today? And what factors is the U.S. dealing with? And what determines U.S. policy in a particular country? And I'll, um, uh, and I'll come back around to the main topic of the conference, which is drone warfare and the new tactics that the U.S. is using overall. So the first thing to understand is the United States, um, although it has the largest military ever assembled on Earth, uh, is actually weaker than they were politically um, a generation ago. Um, and there is a rising trend on Earth for greater independence from their control. Um, the world has changed a lot since 9-11. Um, you can express it in different ways, but the way I think of it is the camp of resistance is growing and U.S. influence is in decline. So the economic crisis gets part of the credit for that. Um, although the capitalists don't suffer like we do when there is an economic crisis, uh, the, you know it has weakened their power and their prestige, uh, and you know and uh, um, and you know that's not whatever that's not just here but that's international. But but even before the economic crisis, Bush's invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq and the Cheney Rumsfeld plan to go after quote Iraq then Syria Lebanon Libya Iran Somalia and Sudan close quote. Um, that had all been an effort by the U.S. to turn back the hands of time, to put the U.S. back on top the way they were when I was a kid, um, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, the wars in Iraq, you know, let's just be very clear on this, those ended in defeats. I mean, we're still occupying Afghanistan, but um, that's currently a stalemate, um, and the United States is on its way to another uh, loss there. Um, so the, the most immediate clear lesson from those two debacles is the United States can't use the method of invasion um, anymore. Invasion and mass occupation not really available to them uh, uh, as a military uh, approach to countries that they don't like the leadership of. Um, so. Uh, and the, and the other thing that's, that's emerged in just in, these, in this last month is, you know, with the role of Russia in the struggle over Syria, what we can see is that, you know, for, for you know, 10 years, people, you know, people have been talking about the rise of the BRIC nations, these rising economic powers that, that don't do everything the United States wants them to do. Well, pretty clearly, Russia has just done something the United States really doesn't want them to do. They've blocked uh, in the United States, uh, in the UN Security Council, they've blocked their, uh, their efforts to get a vote for this war. Um, the other thing that's going against the U.S. is the U.S. Uh, is the people of this country, the people of Britain and the other members of NATO are sick of war. Um, they're, they're, and they're sick of being lied to. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the transparency of the lies around chemical weapons use in, uh, in Syria. Um, have just, uh, you know, have just caused, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, it's practically ubiquitous among public opinion in this country that people do not believe the president. So, um, uh, and, and as a result, when, when he upped the ante in Syria, things came to a head, and Obama found himself isolated on the world stage and isolated here at home. So, uh, so the sudden changes in the U.S. Uh, plans around Syria those are a result of contradictions. You know, first, the U.S. puppet is, the army is, you know, the Free Syrian Army is losing to Syria's army and militia. Second, there's a contradiction between U.S. and Russia, which is no longer standing aside while the U.S. wages war. And third, there's a contradiction between the U.S. and its NATO allied governments and the peoples of those countries. Those contradictions came to a head in changing and forcing the U.S. to retreat. But um, again, let's remember that the U.S. objectives haven't changed. You know, this place is an empire. And 
you know, what do they want? They want cheap labor and they want cheap resources from these, uh, these poorer countries. The United States, as Malcolm X said 50 years ago, is a vampire. Um, they have to have it. Um, it's not policy, it's their essence. They live by drinking the blood and labor of uh, the peoples of this country and the world. So, on the one hand, the U.S. is weaker and unable to get what they want. Um, and on the other hand, they're compelled to keep trying. So, for now, Rumsfeld's vision of invading Syria is gone. But the army of Al-Qaeda armies is not a contradiction. U.S. imperialism will back whoever and whatever serves its interests. In one country, Al-Qaeda, they, they say, is the worst threat of humanity. In the next country, they're recipients of arms and intelligence to fight a government that the U.S. has determined must go. That's not a contradiction. That's just the different faces of, of uh, U.S. foreign policy. Whatever time, place, and condition, they will back anyone to make a, a, an advance in their overall program. So now, you know, while the focus of the media has been on Syria, the focus of U.S. strategy is on Iran. All of the U.S. losses make them focus more and more Iran, on Iran. A new president there doesn't change that. The U.S. has adopted the stand toward Iran that they will not accept a regional power in the Middle East. Syria is aligned with Iran, and so the fate of those two countries is tied together in the view of the empire. Let's, let, let, I just want to talk uh, one minute, too, about the Arab Spring, um, which is, uh, you know, for the United States, both a threat, but then also an opportunity. Um, so right now, the U.S. can't handle a war on the scale of Iraq or, um, or, or greater than that. You know, uh, Iran would be a much greater scale than the war in Iraq. Um, uh, that's why the U.S. was both anxious and excited by the Arab Spring. They used the dissatisfaction throughout the region which was aimed squarely, initially, at their puppets in Egypt, in Tunisia, and in Bahrain. Um, they, they, and then they went, instead, they went after the governments with a history of independence from them, Libya and Syria. The U.S. maneuvered to take control of the situation and develop contradictions in their favor in Libya. And with the success of their operation there, they felt they were in a better position uh, to step up their attempts to topple the government of Syria. As in Libya, they offered support to the Islamists, even though supporting them in Libya resulted in some blowback, you know, in the attacks on the Western oil installations in Algeria and, and the U.S. Embassy. So, so, anyway, in summation, the U.S. seems to be acting in a contradictory way in Syria, but something unites their decisions in every action they take. Is it in the interests of U.S. imperialism? They want to go to war with Syria and Iran, but they don't have the support or the resources for an invasion. They want to bomb Syria, but they can't get support at home or in Britain, and more countries are standing up to them. They are willing to back any force against Assad, even though they worry about Israel, for example, being attacked by the mercenary armies they have created. So they've come up with new tactics. Invasions aren't popular, and they can't rely on the Arab Spring to emerge everywhere. So if you can't invade, how does an empire achieve its objectives of punishing independent people or rebellious populations? The answers they've come up with? Proxy armies, drone warfare, and special operations. Proxy armies are being used in Syria and before that in Libya. Uh, drone warfare first emerged uh, in use against Pakistan because the Pashtun people who live on both sides of the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, you know, that's been the main basis of national resistance on both sides of that border. Um, so, uh, and then the uh, Obama administration took that technology to Yemen and Somalia and Mali and Iran and probably countries that we don't even know about yet. We know that they intend to use it even more in the future uh, because one growth area in the Pentagon's otherwise shrinking budget is the budget for drones. <laughs> So, in our work against U.S. wars, we have to stand against threats to arm puppet armies, to assassinate or back coups, to carry out bombing and missile attacks, and we have to oppose drone warfare as, the, as it is the most popular form of their undeclared wars. Thank you.
Before I introduce the next speaker, we really want to thank the National Lawyers Guild. Pull the mic down. Sorry? Pull the mic down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time's up, Joe. <laughs> Before I introduce the next speaker, I, we really want to thank the National Lawyers Guild here at Kent for giving us this ama amazing space and partnering with us on all of our endeavors. So thank you very, very much. It's great. To um, it's really strange when you introduce somebody that you've known for a long time and um, really look up to and is really one of my heroes. And if it wasn't for our keynote speaker, oh. And if it wasn't for our next speaker, um, I wouldn't be here. So if you like the work I do, you can thank her. And if you don't, you can come talk to me. <laughs> and, and before I continue once again, um, if you're tweeting or if you're looking for information on this, look at hashtag no drones. That's the hashtag we're using, right? All right. Um, Medea Benjamin. I have four lines here, I don't think so, but <laughs> in order to give her time to impart um, her keynote on us, we'll keep it to four lines. Medea is the co-founder of Code Pink and the International Human Rights Organization Global Exchange. She's the author of eight books, including Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control. Um, she's fearless. She's funny. Um, she does things that we all want to do. For example, she questioned Obama in 2013 on his foreign policy address. <laughs> and has taken trips to Pakistan and Yemen and Gaza and Palestine, and the list would go on and on and on. So please give a warm welcome to Dia Benjamin. because we have to look at drones within that global context. And uh, I am amazed in the last couple of weeks what has happened in changing the global context because the American people have risen up and said we don't want more war. And that's quite extraordinary for the American people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it puts us in a whole different context right now. Uh, and as part of that context, I um, held my nose and I went to a meeting the other day that was organized none other than uh, by the Koch brothers. It was the Charles Koch Institute. And I thought, all right, you know, we made some strange bedfellows when we worked against a U.S. invasion in Syria. We, when, when I was doing the work around this, I would be in the, uh, the offices of some of these Congress people and you'd hear the strangest phone calls coming in because you, you heard the receptionist on the other end saying, okay, okay, I will register your opposition to a U.S. invasion of Syria, and yes, I will tell the congressman you don't want to fund Obamacare. <laughs> and, um, and the Tea Party was having uh, mobilizations uh, I, I, in the uh, congressional West Lawn at the same time we were taking over uh, the uh, streets in front of Congress to say no to war in Syria. And they would come over from the Tea Party and say, can we have our pictures taken with Code Pink? Because we never thought we would agree with you on anything. <laughs> so, uh, when we, uh, I went to this Koch Brothers thing, I thought, all right, you know, I'm just going to test out the waters here. Because we were partners, strange partners against the Syria thing. And I talked to one of the people and I said, do you think maybe we should have a meeting with you to talk about drones? And he said, uh, I'm not sure about the drones thing because, you know, we were against Syria because we didn't want to spend more, more, more money uh, on wars and these drones are pretty cheap. And we don't like U.S. soldiers getting killed and they don't get killed when you have drones. And so, you know, maybe we could talk about it, but it's not an easy argument with our people. 
And I thought, uh huh, you know, we've really got to work on these issues. <laughs> so um, part of it is in my book, and I encourage you to get a copy and read it. But we've got to convince people that one, uh, this is not a cheap way to wage war. Uh, first of all, the drones are very expensive. Actually, when you see that a third of them crash, so you have to keep buying more of them, which is built in obsolescence by the industry. They don't want you to keep buying more. Uh, and instead of getting cheaper, they get more expensive because they have fancier equipment and they're made not to crash as much. Uh, and you see something like the Global Hawk that is uh, a $200 million drone, and that crashed in, in Maryland when they were testing it. So, um, and, and then this issue of the U.S. Uh, troops not being killed. Well, they might not be killed in the air, but if you keep these wars going, uh, they're going to be killed in other places, like they're being killed in Afghanistan, like they're attacking U.S. embassies, and like making it harder for us to travel around the world because we're afraid of telling people we're American. Uh, and a lot cheaper is peace. And I think that's what the American people are really saying they want right now. And when we talk about uh, the alternatives, um, let us not allow them to tell us the alternatives are drones. The alternatives are better policing against uh, people who are trying to blow up uh, civilians. Uh, the alternatives are uh, uh, really reducing the US footprint, military footprint around the world so that we are not a target of attack. And I think that's a lot of what Joe was talking about. Um, we will be hated around the world as long as we have over 800 military bases in other people's territories. Uh, we will be hated around the world as long as uh, we are trying to be euphemistically called the world's policemen, but more and more people are understanding it's the world's George Zimmerman. And um, <laughs> so, as we, uh, I'm going to. here for those of you who haven't seen uh, what some of the, uh, the um, results of our drone warfare is. Um, when we are told that we are killing high-level Al-Qaeda people, that might be 2% of the people we're killing by the drones. Uh, we don't know how many people have been killed by drones. I say probably about 5,000, uh, not counting people who have been killed by drones in Afghanistan. And uh, only 2% of them are people who have been on the high value target list. Now, you kill number three in Al Qaeda, uh, what's going to happen? Number four becomes number three. Um, so, uh, in general, though, the majority of people who are being killed are uh, low level Al Qaeda, low level Taliban, uh, and innocent people. We're using the drones, we use them quite a lot in Iraq, uh, still using them in Afghanistan, uh, Libya, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, uh, Philippines. Um, but look below this at all of the places where drone bases are being put up. These are new bases, and we should be very concerned about them not only being throughout the Middle East and Northern Africa, but starting in the Pacific as well. Um, uh, the use of drones in Afghanistan has been going up while the war there is supposed to be winding down. But in other places where we are using these drones, uh, like in Pakistan, the number of drone strikes is going down. Now, part of this is uh, what they uh, call the whack-a-mole policy. You hit them in Pakistan and they go to Yemen, so you start hitting them in Yemen and then they go to Mali. Uh, but the other part is the attention that we've been putting on this issue. And so in Pakistan and Yemen, drone strikes have been going down. They have been trying to be more careful about the number of civilians killed. Uh, but there are still drone strikes and still civilians being killed and still plans to use these drones uh, in other places. Uh, in the case, uh, I'll go quickly through this, and uh, again, these are things that I talk about a lot in the book. Um, photographer who uh, says that when he tries to take pictures of drone, drone victims, most of the time they are vaporized. There's no remains except pieces of flesh lying around on the ground or in trees. Uh, he takes pictures of the people who were hit by the shrapnel from the drones. Uh, we have a list of 178 children uh, killed by drones. You uh, never see these on the mainstream media, uh, but if you did, I think Americans would be a little more sympathetic to the people in places like Pakistan. This is a man, Karim Khan, who we're trying to bring to the United States for the drone summit November 16th and 17th. Uh, to tell the story because he speaks English. He's one of the few people from the tribal areas uh, who do speak English and could be able to tell about how the drone uh, hit his family home, killed his son and his brother. 
Um, I, uh, uh, when um, Pat introduced me, she talked about how I interrupted Obama's speech. And um, I, I felt compelled to do it because he said that the US policy was to capture people and drones were used as a last resort. And I always think of this young man, 16 year old, from uh, the tribal regions of Pakistan who was at a public meeting for an entire week uh, discussing how they could stop the drone strikes that were terrorizing his village. Uh, and uh, two days later, these are the remains of that young man and he could have been easily captured. And of course, to think that a 16-year-old was somehow a high-level Al-Qaeda member who was out to kill Americans is absurd. Uh, but Tariq Aziz is just one of uh, the hundreds of people who could easily have been captured if there was reason to think they were out to kill Americans uh, and instead were just killed. Uh, it's also important to understand when you talk about drones, it's not just the number of people killed or injured by them, it's the terrorizing of entire populations. Uh, this I added into the new version of my book because it's such an important component to say how it's terrorizing uh, children, women, young people trying to, who are afraid to go to schools because school, schools have been hit, uh, women who are afraid to go to the marketplace because markets have been hit, afraid to go to weddings, funerals, any community kinds of gatherings because they hear the drones overhead, they hear the buzzing, they see the drones, they never know when it's going to hit and who is going to be killed People tell us in your war against terror, you are terrorizing entire populations. Um, the response from the Pakistani people have been tremendous. The vast majority of Pakistanis uh, against the drones. They don't like Al-Qaeda, they don't like the Taliban, and they don't like drone strikes. Um, and it was very interesting, Nawaz Sharif just spoke before the UN, uh, and he said in his speech that they consider drone strikes illegal and want drone strikes in their nation to stop. Um, the other place where drones are being used uh, frequently is in Yemen. And in the case of Yemen, it's interesting because the president of Yemen uh, was put in place after the Arab Spring there uh, took down the dictator, but he was the vice president. So he's put in there as an interim uh, a placeholder while the Yemenis are figuring out the next phase of their, their transition government. Well, he was just in the United States meeting with President Obama. He has been in favor of drone strikes. And yet, the National uh, Dialogue Conference, which is uh, 485 people elected by all uh, walks of society in Yemen and have been meeting to figure out the transition, voted overwhelmingly to say that drone strikes were illegal and they did not want drone strikes in their country. So there is one person in Yemen who is calling for drone strikes and the people who represent the vast majority and have been elected to represent the vast majority are against drone strikes. Um, so I'm going to go through these quickly. The, uh, this is a, a man who I think uh, has a voice that's very important to listen to, and we are trying to get him a visa to the United States for the drone summit as well, uh, because he is part of a, a, a large tribe that is very angry. His brother was killed uh, in a drone strike. He was a taxi driver, picked up some unknown people that the U.S. perhaps thought were, uh, were Al-Qaeda, uh, maybe they were, uh, but blew up the taxi. Uh, and he came with the, his brother's children, who will never know their father again, and uh, with pieces of the drone to show that these were American Hellfire missiles. But if you look at this man's face, and I'll just go back for you to look at it, um, you see sorrow and you see anger. And he said that in his society, if you do something wrong, you have to atone for it. You have to acknowledge what you did, you have to apologize for what you did, and you have to provide compensation. That the US has done none of this. And he says, could it be that his tribal culture is more evolved than the US government when it comes to justice? <laughs> This is a young man you might have seen when he testified before Congress and said that in his village, uh, anybody would have known if there was a high-level Al-Qaeda person there. In fact, uh, somebody should have told them if there was a suspect, they would have brought him in. Uh, and in his small village, there was a drone attack, he said, that did something in an instant what the extremists could never do, which is turn the entire village uh, against the United States. And this happens every time there is a drone strike. 
And this uh, woman that you see in the picture is a story that we were told in Yemen. Um, and she didn't say my uh, brothers were in the wrong place at the wrong time. She said, my, my brothers were fighting against a dictatorship in this country. Uh, and as part of looking around and seeing uh, who were fighting against a dictatorship, uh, she said her brothers joined Al-Qaeda, three of them. And she said, um, this would be the equivalent in the United States of young people who joined a gang. And I tried to convince my brothers that they got in with the wrong group, uh, that this was uh, not a good way to fight the government. Uh, and that instead of getting rehabilitation, instead of getting some kind of way to uh, reincorporate them into society, the US just blew them up with the drone strike. She said, my brothers had no problem with the United States, didn't know the United States at all. Uh, and why should the US come in into an internal conflict and turn it into an international conflict? And that is a lot of what's happening with the drones. And so when you hear militants were killed, even if they were militants, even if they were people who had joined Al-Qaeda, you have to wonder, why did they join Al-Qaeda? Was it something local that they were fighting? And do we want to be going around killing 17, 18, 19 year olds, which is the majority of people who we are killing, and think that if this has to do with 9-11, these people were 10 years old uh, when 9-11 happened. Uh, so one thing I think when we, we talk to people that we want to bring into this larger tent of, of uh, of, of uh, drones uh, being bad for humanity is to say that the U.S. is not the only country that has drones. In fact, our uh, companies are selling drones all over the world. Uh, but the largest exporter of drones is Israel. And Israel brags in its marketing materials how it is constantly upgrading and battle testing the drones. And of course, this is on the Palestinian people. Uh, as well as on uh, other people in the region because they have used them in Lebanon as well. Uh, and then the third country that is a major producer of drones and exporter now is China. China quickly tech catching up with the technology. In fact, through their cyber warfare, are getting the plans for US drones and are uh, using the US um, company's technology to produce their own drones. So. What we are fighting uh, here is a drone lobby that is extremely powerful, that has its own congressional caucus that's made up mostly of Republicans, but also Democrats, especially Democrats who have large manufacturers in their districts. And they are so powerful that they are changing the export rules so that the US can sell these drones to known human rights uh, abusers around the world. And they are changing the, the rules so that the US companies can sell these drones here at home. Well, when we're talking to people who are from the Tea Party or friends of the Koch brothers or, uh, uh, or your own relatives, um, one of the things we really have to talk about is uh, how the drones are coming to uh, be used against us here at home. And in fact, that man that I showed you from uh, Yemen, whose brother had been killed, he said something profound. He said, we feel like we are guinea pigs here, that you are testing out this technology on us. And he said uh, to us that when you go home and talk to people about it, tell them what I said, because uh, if you're not worried about killing poor people in countries like Yemen, you should be worried about what's going to happen when the technology is turned on you. And that is, um, I think, a very profound statement that we should uh, talk to people about because what is happening is already that uh, the Federal Aviation Administration has been forced by Congress to open up our airspace by September 2015 and that in the meantime have been given out hundreds of permits to uh, both uh, companies, government entities, universities, and police departments to start the experimental use of drones. Uh, we should be concerned, for example, the first one on here at the FBI, you might have heard last week that they came out with a report saying the FBI had used uh, three to five million dollars on drones uh, and um, they are giving money to police departments to be using drones. Uh, Border Patrol, as we heard from our friend yesterday, uh, they are increasing the number of drones that are used both in the southern and the northern border. Uh, and I should have put uh, Boeing on here in the companies because it certainly is one of the major companies that is involved in drone warfare and it's important that we focus on these companies. 
uh, universities. Uh, it's great that student groups are now looking at their ties to uh, the production of lethal weapons with the military grants that their engineering partner departments are getting and trying to break those contracts. And then the police departments. There are 18,000 police departments here in the United States. If it was up to the drone manufacturers, every single month one of them would have them. And who do you think would be spied on with these drones? Raise your hand if you think you might be one of them. I know Joe, you will be one of them. So um, there are a lot of people in our country who do value their <coughs> privacy. And even if they don't care about killing poor people of, co of color in other countries around the world, um, they might not like the drones being used to spy on them. They don't like the NSA revelations that thanks to Edward Snowden we know about. And drones would uh, up that to another level of 24-7 kind of surveillance <coughs> society. So, just to conclude, I think it's very exciting that Evanston, Illinois, is one of the places that has passed a no drone resolution. As part of the workshops, we're going to be discussing how to spread that to other places around here. It's also quite extraordinary that 41 states, 41 states in this country, are either discussing or passing some kind of re resolution uh, trying to curb the use of drones before the September 2015 deadline comes to be. And uh, that is uh, thanks to the work of groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, groups like the ACLU doing extraordinary work. Now they're not as strong as we might like them, they certainly don't say don't use drones at all, but they say that if you're going to use them there should be a search warrant. If you're going to use them there there should be some probable cause, uh, or there should be a moratorium until we can figure out how to use these things. Um, there is a national bill that we should be supporting, uh, introduced by a right-wing uh, Republican from Texas called, uh, 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 named uh, Congressman Poe, along with a progressive from California, Zoe Lofgren, uh, that says not only should there, must there be a court order, but there, it also says that drones will not be armed here in the United States. So we should support that national legislation. Uh, what are some of the things that we could possibly get out of Congress? Well, the best that we could get is potentially something that says drones should be out of the hands of the CIA. We should outlaw signature strikes, which are the strikes that allow the CIA to kill on the basis only of suspicious behavior, and that leads to a lot of innocent people being killed. Uh, and potentially a compensation fund for uh, innocent people who have been killed by these drones. I think it's very important we get some champions in Congress, and some of us have been talking about uh, getting Congressman Keith Ellison, who feels uh, bad about his betrayal of the progressive community with his support for an invasion in Syria, and might be uh, predisposed right now to help us on this issue. Uh, and there is a, there are some uh, uh, positive things happening at the UN level. There is a campaign uh, to try to stop killer ro robots. These are autonomous weapons that have not been deployed yet, but a good international campaign in place to stop them before they could be used. Uh, and there is a report coming out October 25th in the UN that will look at the use of US, uh, NATO, and Israeli use of drones to see how war crimes been committed. So we are anxious for that to report to come out. And then finally, I invite you all to join us at the Drone Summit. This is Washington, D.C. It is not too far from you. Uh, uh, November 16th and 17th, the day before, we will be protesting at the headquarters of drone manufacturers as well as outside of uh, the, uh, uh, the White House. The day afterwards, we'll, we'll be in the Congress protesting at the, uh, uh, the offices of Congress. People have been supporting the Strong uh, Caucus. And during those two days, we will have people from Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, from uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, we will have some of the best international experts on uh, international law in the entire world. We will have former drone operators who have decided they can't continue to do that work. Uh, and so it's really going to be an extraordinary time to come together. And we hope that out of that drone summit, will be a reinvigorated uh, and, and stronger and more effective network 
uh, in the United States, but globally as well, because we will have people coming from not only the countries that have been victims of the drone attacks, but also from the European countries that are getting and arming their own drones. So I hope that some of you will join us, and uh, if not, if you can't come, at least make sure that your uh, group is sending a representative there. So thank you very much for having me and for the work you're doing. I look forward to the workshops and to seeing the Midwest as really a model for the entire country of how, of how we can stop the drone. Ooh.
uh, this uh, Russian satellite was taking a picture, and the picture will go into Ban Ki Moon, uh, proving the uh, criminals, they are the ones who did the, use the uh, chemical weapon. So, but uh, the United Nations, as you know, being controlled, uh, Ban Ki Moon will not be able to do anything except if you take orders from US and other NATO countries. So, uh, we all against occupation, and Mr. Obama, he was talking about, liber about liberating Syria, uh, as they did in Iraq. They liberate Iraq from the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. They are looking to liberate Syria from the Syrian. Also liberate the life from the Syrian. Because fighting Muslim and Syria will not bring democracy, it just will bring death and tragedies. And if Mr. Obama in love with the Arab or whoever under occupation, why U.S. used 42 vetoes against Israel in order for the, them to just uh, against the uh, Israeli occupation in Palestine? So, the Palestinian people have been under occupation for 60 years. It's the longest, the longest time in history people have been under occupation. And no one looking at them, they've been totally dead. Matter of fact, a lot of the weapons been used against them, they were American made, Boeing or other companies, including the white phosphor was used in Gaza a few years ago. So the Bahraini people, they are under the occupation of the Saudi army for two years. No one's talking about. Same thing in the East Saudi, a place called Qatif. There's four million people under occupation of the Saudi royal family. The Saudi royal family export to us here 13 hijackers for September 11, killed more than 4,000 American innocent. The government of the United States did nothing, and now the government of the United States working with the Saudi in Qatar in places which they don't have constitution to create a revolution in Syria. So far they fail, they will fail, because Syria is secular, Syria is modern, and uh, Syrian people willing just to stand from any of the intervention from outside because they love their, their country. In order for Obama to be they started in Syria, as the Syrian told me, he has to bomb and kill 25 million in Syria. And I don't believe he will do it, and I don't believe the American will let him do that. American values is way better than what Mr. Obama and his government showing. The Syrian loves the American. None of the Syrian ever harms the American in the past. Great relation, especially after September 11, between CIA and Syrian uh, intelligence, exchanging information about Al-Qaeda member. So Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, fought Al-Qaeda in uh, Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, and other places, and lost more than 10,000 American soldiers. After all this decade, U.S. opened up a dialogue with Taliban and opened up an office for them in Qatar, Disputing the values of those American men and women being killed overseas fighting Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is enemy of the NATO in Mali, for example, but they are friends to them in Syria. They've been funded armed by the NATOs, including the US, a few hundred million dollars to those criminals. So basically, you work in paying your taxes, and some of your money going to kill some Syrian through those terrorists, or some Palestinian through the Israeli or somebody else, anything around the world. The Syrians need dialogue. They need the United States government. Again, I insist United States government, because Syria knows the American people are great people, great value. They are sure President Obama does not represent the American values. Say they want you. They want you to work through your congressmen and women to convince Mr. Obama to stop dreaming. It's the longest dream in history. He's been dreaming two and a half years about dividing Syria and defeating the Syrian army and taking President Assad out of the office. After two and a half years, the dream did not come true, and it will not come true. You have such a commanding voice, we really love you, but it's so muffled and part of the ears, you're losing some of the concentration in your beautiful speech. Thank you. So, is my voice good enough to be a singer? I want the thing to be over and share because that's the reason. The Syrian wants the American people to work through their congressmen and women to stop Mr. Obama from dreaming two and a half years.
this target will not gain through in, gain through in Syria. So he had, he had just to let the Syrian solve their problem on their own. Any interfering from outside will make it worse. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the main reason for Mr. Obama to do that, uh, the President Assad, he is the only Arab president is not accepting order from the West, including U.S. Mm -hmm. They want him to be, uh, I'm sorry for the word, sissy or puppies like the Arab leader. So uh, he won't, he won't do that because he has a right. Give me my land, I'll sign a peace. That's why the problem, they want him to sign a peace without having the Jolan Heights back. Also, Syria is looking for the Palestinian territory, which being occupied in 1967, to have a Palestinian country. They are supporting the right of refugees, will be up to the refugees to take money or go back. And these things being always vetoed by USA. So, the Syrian army is defending their country. They are the sons, the father, the brothers of the Syrian people. That's why after two and a half years, these guys been defending their country against invaders from out of Syria. A lot of them don't speak Arabic. As a Syrian, the alphabet was born in my country. I cannot accept with all my respect a guy from Somalia or Chechnya or Saudi Arabia and come and teach me a history and do a revolution in my country. Saudi Arabia, as a woman, None of you could walk as you are because you have to be covered. And you cannot drive, you cannot have a nail polish. And if, if a husband of a wife in the U.S. and his wife in Saudi Arabia, she is unable to travel to come and see him, he has to go and bring her. They are treating a woman, you know, like not a human being. And again, the United States supporting this government. So. At Bashar Assad, he's not the other Arab leader. He's a great guy, and he's the only and he's the only Arab leader who spent ten years in the West countries in London studying and working as a doctor. And during my twenty trips to Syria, I see nothing but freedom, freedom of religions, freedom of movement. You can do anything. Just don't uh, have a group and have a weapons and try to attack anybody. We used to have one party before. Lately, he's changed the constitution. And now we have 15 parties in Syria. And the whole 15 parties able to run for president during the next coming election. But the NATO's country, including the US, they don't want him to run because they know he's going to win. His people want him. If the Syrian doesn't want their president, he will, he will be gone already after two and a half years. After two and a half years from chaos in Syria, he's still walking down the street, going to a restaurant, eating with his own people. And one of the time, my best friends was there. He was eating on the table next to him. That's a proof. Uh, his people love him. So I'm not saying that because uh, I work for government or anything. No, I'm just telling you the truth. But the problem here as an American, we always look at the news and the news showing us what they want us to see. I ask every one of you or any one of you just to go to Syria and I, and I am ready to go with him or her and you can walk down the street and talk to people. Ask them what's going on. You come back with the truth. U.S. know that and the other Arab country knows that. Turkey, they have a problem in Turkey more than us, but they want to export their problem to Syria. So just to appear the government of Syria. And, and they are right now letting the criminals go through the border without stamping their passport. These guys, uh, more than 60,000 of those, came in through the Turkish border without stamping their passport. These guys, when their mission is over in Syria, they're going to have to go somewhere else. The United States could be one of the countries they will go back to. So we'll probably we'll be going to see another bombing here and there. God forbid another September 11. So the United States government has to wake up and stop support those groups because they are against everybody in the world. They've been supported in Libya. The first thing they did, they told the American ambassadors to Libya. 
That's the type of people the United States helping and supporting. Uh -huh. We want you to work with us. We want to work together to stop the threat of Syria. Syria did nothing to the United States. It's not fair to go and bomb a country just because they have a dream. God told me to go. This is not right. Uh, we should not control the world. We can control the world by respectful way. Like if you go back to Bill Clinton's time, he was a great leader dealing with everybody else through the United Nations. But then after him, we have a terrible president. Every morning they wake up, they want to do something overseas. Why? I don't know. We should stop you from doing that. Syria loves America. God bless America. God bless Syria. Thanks to a great brother, Joe, for the great job he did so far. Thanks for the great sister, uh, Katie, for the great job she did. Thank you all. We love you as a Syrian. And I hope things will be okay in Syria soon with your support to stop the threatening. Thank you for being here again.
the, uh, their policy and we have, the, our government have implemented that. So as for the drone attack is concerned, uh, this started in 2004 in Pakistan with the consent of the military government at that time. But after the military government uh, was gone and the so-called democratic government came in 2008, they followed the same policy and they used to tell to the American, that, don't worry, when the drone attacks take place, we will just protest because for the consumption of the people. Uh, but it's okay with us. No, there has been recently a new election, and there were two major parties. One is the Nawaz Sharif Party, Muslim League, the other a great leader, Imran Khan. And both give the place to the people that if we came into power, we will do two things, mainly. That's why they, this is a war type of thing I'm concerned. Number one, we will stop the drone attacks. And number two, there are, for the last nine years, when there was uh, this 9-11 uh, happened, and we were ruled by a military dictator, so the, the American government, in order to support the Palestinian United States, the military government at that time sent uh, more than 100,000 uh, forces, armed forces, to the tribal area. And they started the war against those because I'm Pashtun, and the one part of Pashtun live on the Pakistan side, and the other in Afghanistan. The same language, the same culture, same tradition, following the same uh, things. So it so happened that uh, when they were sent to tribal area, more than hundred thousand dollars, and they start war against the tribal area people. So. Uh, using gunship aircraft, uh, F-16, tanks. So closer to two million people, innocent people fled beside whatever number were killed uh, to, to this area of the uh, Pakistan and just to take refuge. And they are still living in inhuman standard. No clean water, nothing uh, whatever is required for uh, the human being. So the present government, as I told you, they, they give a pledge, but still the uh, drone continues, and according to the neutral uh, investigation, more than Benjamin no met more than me because she had written a book, I read the book, and beside that she had gone to Pakistan, and uh, so she knows a lot, and she told you before I uh, in the morning today, but uh, there are different estimates that say that more than 3,000 people or so have been killed, innocent people, children and women and every, uh, everybody. So I, I still we suspect, keeping in view the past experience, that whether the present government in the, in the, in the central lead by Nawaz Sharif is really doing the same thing that they used to tell the previous governments that okay, we will just protest, but you do whatever you do, use the drone attacks, or they will be honest and will try to stop it by any means. He did spoke in a uh, uh, general assembly about the drone attacks, but I would like that he should, uh, that should be true. True. What Mr. Obama says, uh, I hope that, okay, these uh, drones are very precise and inhuman. I don't know what he means by inhuman and very precise. But I will just give an example. Uh, one of the United Nations ambassador, uh, Ms. Power, she says that it's, it's never precise and it's, a, it's so indiscriminately used and incapable to distinguish between the child and between the so-called rebel they call it. Because how it is possible, a thousand feet away, uh, the, the drone will, will, will hit, it can't even dim, the, 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 the so-called terrorists or whatever they give the name. Unfortunately, the, the word terrorist has been misused always, either the interpretation is done by the imperialists or the uh, other ruling classes in a, in a particular country. 
So I don't understand if somebody, I understand, and it's true, that if somebody blasts and kills innocent people, there's terrorism. But what about the drone that, uh, sent by a particular government to another country and killing innocent people? What do you call it? What do you call it? But since the definition is, it has been done just by the ruling classes, or the, uh, the power, so uh, they make the decision. So, the other thing is that besides this, as I spoke to you a minute ago, that for the last nine years, besides drone attacks, the Pakistani military regime is there for nine years in tribal area, more than $100,000, using all kind of weapons, as I said, uh, they're using F-16, and uh, other kind of, uh, uh, whatever they have in the power. But now, the two parties who came in power, one if led by Imran Khan in my state, in my province, and the other by uh, Imran Nawaz Sharif, they also give the promise that we will have peaceful negotiation with the people in the tribal area who are fighting uh, uh, against us. And no, uh, recently, there were two, uh, three uh, conferences, all party conferences, they call it. All party party, uh, political party participated in there. But recently, there was a very good all party conference, and they unanimously gave power to the present government to negotiate with them. But when recently, Nawaz Sharif, uh, who was who is here in New York and was addressing National Assembly, uh, the Secretary of State met him, and uh, after that he changed his statement. And he said that, uh, okay, negotiation can take place with two, uh, uh, two things. Number one, the people who are in war uh, and fighting with the Pakistani army or the, the people here, they should do two things. They should surrender their weapon, number one, and number two, they should accept the constitution of Pakistan. I don't heard that they accept the constitution or not accept, but uh, the power was given by all parties, and now he's changing his version. So we suspect that there may be a full fledged because the military establishment doesn't want this. So we, we suspect that there may be a full fledged war against the tribal era, which was there already. And because of the war, they didn't solve it. They should be without negotiation. Nowhere in the world they can solve anything. Anything can be solved through negotiation. And particularly Pashtun, uh, particularly Pashtun, they can never, never surrender uh, their arms without the negotiation. So we should also send a message to the government of Pakistan, at the same time the political parties, that they should stick to their uh, decision they made that there should be a peaceful negotiation. This way, I would uh, have some certain uh, suggestion or resolution which can move from our this uh, August forum. Number one, that uh, the United, that uh, all drones through which the people have been killed, the victim, they should be compensated. And drone in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, and other parts of the world shall immediately be stopped. Number two. <laughs> Besides drone attacks, they say the Pakistani military establishment is planning to wage a fulfilled war. We should send a message to the government of Pakistan, political parties, that they should not do it and settle the issue with a peaceful negotiation and talk with them. The other thing is in what I've stated in Balochistan, there's a military there, innocent people who, who don't agree with the central government and their policies, they, they arrest them, kill them, and send their, uh, and throw their bodies in the street. So we also send a message that our troops from Balochistan should be uh, withdrawn. But at the same time, we should say that when they start negotiation, they can only start that there should be a ceasefire between the two groups, between the militant and between the Pakistani forces, so that the negotiation could be successful.
for this, I will finish there. Thank you again for uh, and giving the opportunity. Thank you, Saeed. Um, most of you have probably guessed this by now, but um, we had a bit of a change in our program. Um, unfortunately, Vince Emanuele wasn't able to, from IBAW, wasn't able to come today. Um, but I'm very honored to have Saeed speak because um, it's very important that we hear from these countries that are one of you know, the victims of drone attacks. So can you give another hand for... <laughs> Up next, we have Muhammad Sankari, um, who is from the U.S. Palestinian Community Network, Chicago. Um, I've known Muhammad for... Um, about two years, um, and I'm always impressed by both his kindness and gentleness and the way he works with the Students for Justice in Palestine groups that are, you know, different chapters throughout Chicago. So I'd like everybody to give a warm welcome to Muhammad. I'm not really good with mics, so is this good? Can everyone hear yeah. Um, so, I'm upgrading now. I have my yellow notepad, but I'm going to try it off the 21st century approach um, for our statement today. Um, so, the United States Palestinian Community Network, Chicago chapter, would like to express its gratitude and utmost solidarity to all of you gathered in this room today and those who protested at Boeing's headquarters of death yesterday. As representatives of the Arab community, we know all too well the realities of these so called weapons of war. But drones are not just a weapon of war, they are a weapon of massacre. How banal committing war crimes has become when a soldier in an air-conditioned trailer sitting at a computer thousands of miles away makes a decision to murder civilians with the push of a button, never knowing them. The dead are just faceless shadows on a screen as if it was all some tragic video game. But this is not a game for those who have been killed and maimed by these weapons of destruction. The buzzing drone engine speaks the universal language of death for children from Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Palestine. Children like Khadija Ali Mukbel Luqayya, who was only one year old when a U.S. drone ended her life in Yemen. Or the Israeli drone strike that killed two generations in a one split second in their home in the Jabalia refugee camp. Or the Israeli strikes in Absan, Deir al Bala, Gaza City, and countless other places across Palestine. For years, the Israelis have perfected unmanned aircraft technologies on bodies of civilians in Lebanon and in Palestine, as the countless people that they have killed were faceless, nameless means to a technological end. Their unmanned surveillance vehicles deployed in the brutal occupation of Lebanon in 1982 caught the eye of the US who worked with them to develop these technologies we have seen today be it an operation cast lead, the massacre of thousands of residents by Israel in 2009, or the continuation of the almost daily drone strikes in Yemen and Pakistan by the <coughs> United States today. Drones have become an invaluable tool for U.S. empire, a technological angel of death, which delivers the clearest message to the people from Pakistan to Palestine, that at any moment, without any warning, a U.S. or Israeli soldier can decide to end any life anywhere with the push of a button miles away. <coughs> the drone strikes in Palestine, along with other acts of war supported by the U.S., are used to demoralize the Palestinian people and force them to abandon their will for national liberation. These calculated measures are meant to force the Palestinians to negotiate away their right of return to their original homes they were forced out from in 1948, the right to live free and dignified lives. But no amount of disproportionate violence will ever crush the will of the national liberation struggle. <laughs> Palestinians will not be violently blackmailed to sit at the table with war criminals like Netanyahu. They will reject all phony peace plans put forward by the likes of John Kerry or any other U.S. representatives. <laughs> the only way for peace will come with the end of the Israeli colonization and occupation of, of Palestine and the return of all the Palestinian refugees and their children to their land and rightful homes. Yeah. And here we are in Chicago, where yesterday people from all across the Midwest stood and shouted directly to challenge the power of Boeing's machines of death. 
and their creators. So let us keep up the shouting and keep marching and keep organizing until the CEOs of Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Israeli Aerospace Industries, and all the others that cash out on the blood of innocents trade their Armani designer clothing for orange jumpsuits. <laughs> Pennsylvania <laughs> and uh, we have a statewide campaign going on and we have about 130 people come out once a month so far to this Naval Air Station, uh, formerly Naval Air Station, but this is going to be a new drone control center and it's outside of Philadelphia about 15 miles and then we have downtown leafleting and vigiling twice a month in downtown Philadelphia and that's primarily an educational campaign. We always have leaflets so that people in the community uh, wake up to the fact that these drones are going to be very active close by. The Thank Death you. March, you also do this? Oh, the yeah. Death March is a, a format that some of you might want to try and that, uh, he, I spoke about it in the workshop and so once a month uh, everyone in the march dresses in black and a white mask and is totally silent, single file, through the city, through certain neighborhoods, and we're representing the civilians that have been killed by the drones. So it's become an anti-drone death march. Four years we've been doing this, carrying signs and handing out leaflets. And if any of you are interested, um, you can contact one of us and we'll tell you the format, you know, how to do it if you want to try it. It's, it's, it's like street theater and it does attract attention uh, in the city streets. Is it on YouTube? No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not up on that, but you can contact <laughs> AFSC and Peter will forward it to me rather than my trying to give out my email. Thank you. and the Little Falls uh, Partners for Peace in central, rural central Minnesota. Uh, we're uh, at Camp Ripley. Uh, it's a major uh, National Guard training facility. Uh, recently inaugurated a drone training facility. And two weeks ago today, we carried out our second uh, protest at the main gates of the camp. And we'll uh, continue trying to educate the public in central Minnesota about, the, about drone warfare and drone surveillance.
can speak for some of the Milwaukee groups. Um, the Milwaukee SDS and the Milwaukee Anti-War Committee and Iraq Vets Against the War are all part of a uh, citywide coalition uh, for Palestine Solidarity, the Milwaukee Palestine Solidarity Coalition. We have a pretty big campaign for boycott, divestment, and sanctions against uh, companies who are profiting off the occupation, which is a movement spreading worldwide that started in 2005. Um, as a call from Palestinian civil society. Um, so a lot of the corporations that are involved in that are like corporations who are involved in drone making and enforcing the occupation. Any other groups? There? I just have an announcement. Um, Anti-war committee is having um, well, we call it a supper club, although the next meeting will be actually lunch. But I just wanted to make the announcement so you can put it on your calendar. Um, we're meeting at 1 p.m. on October 13th at Forest Home Cemetery. And we have a labor historian, Mark Rogovin, who's going to give us a tour. And it's a potluck picnic in the cemetery. I know it sounds a little weird. But it is a real treasure to have this in the Chicago area. People from all over the world know yeah. about this, and a lot of Chicagoans yeah. don't know about it. But the um, communists and gypsies and activists have been buried there traditionally. And so it's Emma a, Goldman. Emma Goldman. And why, are they buried, why are they buried there? Because the Haymarket Martyrs are buried. Right, the Haymarket Martyrs are there. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great place, and it should be a really wonderful day. So uh, maybe you even want to come from Minnesota. It's, <laughs> it's <laughs> worth it. <laughs> October 13th at 1 p.m. And you can, actually, I give my email. Um, I know that not everyone, you really do need a car to get there. So we'll work out carpooling if you don't have a car. And my email is sadiejane58 at sbcglobal.net. Doesn't the Congress Hill in there? Uh, it does. You can walk from the con you can walk from the last uh, stop on the Congress Hill, the Forest Park, the Forest Park um, stop. Mm -hmm. okay. That's how, that, that's in fact that's how they buried them. They brought oh. them they brought the coffins out in 1886. They brought them out on that train. Wow. Oh. So maybe we should do that. That's very good. <laughs> 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 Sadie Jane 58 at sbcglobal.net. And if you could put Supper Club in the ha subject heading, that'll help me not miss it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, MC War Committee in Minneapolis <laughs> um, is here. <laughs> we were not prepared with a report, so I'm sorry. Um, and the person we're going to try to shove off on that job is out of the room. But, um, you know, our work um, focuses on responding to U.S. threats of war, and in particular in solidarity with Palestine and fighting the threat of war against Syria. Um, over the course of the summer and spring, we we're doing ongoing work alongside that around drones, um, trying to integrate people's understanding of the danger of these terrible weapons of war and the U.S. agenda of war and military aid, places like Israel. Our ongoing work includes BDS work, um, a particular campaign in Minnesota is against SodaStream, which is something no one needs anyway, so it's easy to boycott. And um, <laughs> just saying, like, make your own pop. Uh, anyway, um, uh, like we, we, anyway, we won't say that. But, um, and then finally, uh, uh, also a lot of our work includes defense of anti-war activists and international solidarity activists targeted with government repression. And, um, we had a little anniversary recently, which I think was mentioned before earlier in the weekend, um, but we've been kind of focused on that as well. So, um, but we're really glad to be here, and we've learned a lot, I think, I think for all of us. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is we started our <laughs> drones work with a book club, reading Medea's book together, and um, we're going to continue to see that as a part of our ongoing work in opposing U.S. war.
you guys made little, um, was it balsa wood? Yeah, Air balsa planes, wood planes. Um, That said, fly kites, not drones. So that's like a really like neat way of like handing something out to people that, you know, it's a fun little toy, but also carries a very serious message. So I wanted to add those two things. Thanks. I think y'all are awesome. <laughs> but yeah, is there Maybe you can give me an extra port for us. <laughs> <laughs> Money for jobs and education, not for war and occupation.